Hi, so we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, my name is uh, Asim Siddiqui. Uh, I think I had a, probably, Francis probably said a few words about me yesterday, but I'll, I don't know if you, Francis, you, you, did you say anything about me yesterday other than I'm an evil, <laughs> I'm an evil industry dude stuff. now? All yeah. So you probably, you work here. yeah. So I used to, I, yes, so that's true. So I used, that is actually true. I used to work with Francis. <laughs> Uh, when I, I lived in uh, Vancouver for, for a number of years, I was at the Genome Sciences Center there. Um, and uh, but in the last uh, last few years, I've been in on, moved into the corporate side of things, to the dark side. And uh, and then for the purposes of full disclosure, I'm now working for applied biosystems life technologies, um, and uh, working on the solid platform. Um, so I won't. Uh, I will, I'll, I'll try and ensure that I keep a fairly neutral, neutral tone to my lecture. There won't be any Borat-style um, singings of the U.S. national anthem saying A, A B is the best technology in the world, and all the other technologies are not so good. Anyway, there will be none of that. So, um, so, uh, but I'll, but I would say if you have any questions on the platforms, I can answer answer specific questions about Solid. Um, but if you have any questions about uh, Luminor 454, uh, probably I'll, I'll direct those to my colleagues. And certainly, if it comes to points of comparison, just to be fair, I'll direct those to my colleagues as well. Um, okay, so if you made it so made it through the lectures so far, you'll be glad to know that there's uh, very little math this afternoon. Um, if that was something that was bothering you, I have no equations on my on my slides. For my first set of slides, I, it, we're calling this transcriptome, but it's really um, any sort of counting application. And for counting applications, the only math you really need to know is Poisson, as a Poisson distribution. If you know the Poisson distribution, you basically have all the tools you need. Um, you can use um, Poisson stats to calculate significance. Of, of difference given given uh, the depth of the library and uh, counts, um, and uh, if you've done any sort of sage profiling in the past, you'll probably be familiar with those types of techniques. So, the, and these are I should say these are essentially these are pretty much exactly the same slides I used last year. Um, there have been a few developments uh, since since uh, since last year, um, and I'll speak to a few of the changes that have happened. Uh, from understand from talking to some of my colleagues uh, over dinner last night is that there's there was some consternation yesterday on the uh, changes that are occurring in our space and it, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, new new technologies new advances being made uh, you know I I would sort of counter that somewhat saying that if you're really interested if you're a bioinformatician, you obviously you want to keep on top of the latest techniques and, and algorithms that are out there, um, and that's where you where you make your mark. Um, but if you're more on the biology side and you're really interested in getting to the bottom of a biological question, if you take a method that's been developed a year ago, it's probably going to work just fine uh, to get some interesting biology out of it. Now you may not have necessarily the most sensitivity, or there may be certain questions which only the latest methods are able to answer. Um, but you can probably get 90% of the value out of out of methods that, that are already out there. Okay, so I'm going to start off uh, by just talking about the types of uh, problem spaces I'm looking at. Um, the talk, this first talk is really around what, what do you do beyond just genome sequencing? What are the other sorts of questions you want to ask um, around uh, uh, around uh, mRNA sequencing? Should I keep going? All right. Um, what are the other types of questions? Ooh, suddenly became loud. What are the other types of uh, what are the other types of questions that are of interest? Uh, and what type? What are, what of these questions can you answer using uh, the next generation uh, sequencing devices? Um, and the natural questions that follow once you have a genome is is to actually understand how that genome is impacting the cell's function and how the cell is actually working. And to get at that. Uh, there are questions around which proteins, or which proteins are uh, being uh, are present in that cell, uh, also which mRNAs are present, um, how those proteins are functioning, uh, functioning, and where they're binding to uh, the genome or to mRNAs, um, and uh, what's methylated, what's being turned on and off. So basically, how does how does this whole milieu of, of biological species 
work to create a functioning cell. Okay, so this is, I'm sure, familiar to, to everyone in the room, but the, the basic relationship between DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, I wasn't here yesterday, but I'm assuming most people have, this would be familiar to everyone, right? I don't need to go through this again. Okay, so the transcriptome of a cell. So the transcriptome is the entire set of RNA transcripts in that cell. Interesting features about the transcriptome is that it's cell specific, so different cell types will have different transcriptomes. And it is time, time variant, so over time course, uh, you will see that transcriptome modify in response to various stimulus that are applied to that cell. Understanding how the, the transcriptome at, at, in those different states allows us to understand how the cells differentiate and uh, how they're going to respond to the changes that are occurring in their environment. Transcriptomes and cells, transcripts, historically, uh, with thought of transcripts as being relatively simple things, as we are able to investigate them in more and more detail using the newer techniques, we're, we're learning new things about them. So uh, in terms of their splicing, for, for example, uh, we used to, be, used to be thought that there were a relatively limited number of splice forms associated with each, with each gene. Um, now, over the last year or so, with the recognition that uh, there are a lot more splices out there, and, so, and essentially 90, over 90 percent of genes um, have multiple splices, um, and there are a lot more splice forms than we previously thought. And this has really been made possible by the deep sequencing um, that uh, that uh, whole transcriptome sequencing allows. Um, I'll, I'll expand on that later on. So there's, there's various forms um, of the of the uh, of the of the transcriptome database. So historically, we made gene expression experiments using northern plot threats and RT-PCR. Um, the downside of these types of assays is that they're targeted to a specific locus. Um, ESTs provide a more genome-wide scan for transcription elements, um, and their major reason they aren't used today is the cost. But with now, with the cost of sequencing uh, being reduced through to, uh, by the next-gen sequencing, we're able to actually now come back to, to this way of, of, of sequencing uh, uh, the, the RNAs. So chips are still a, a very popular uh, microRNA chips. Um, they've been highly successful, um, and they have the advantage, I think, that right now they still uh, are cheaper than, uh, than running a next-gen ex experiment of equivalent depth. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that in, in, in a few slides' time. Um, they are, they're useful, uh, they're useful, uh, yeah, this is wrong. I said they're useful when there's no genome sequence. They're not that, that's, that's, that's incorrect. They're not, they're not that useful when there's no genome sequence. You, you need to have a sequence, gen sequence genome in order to use uh, chips. Um, and they provide a 500-fold variation across the uh, uh, across uh, expression levels. Um, they've also been approved um, for clinical use. There's, there's a couple of chips that have been approved for clinical use as well. Um, and uh, but the disadvantage is that you're limited to what's what you're observing on that on that chip. Um, that probe, the probes that are spotted onto the chip, are specific to the locus that have been designed. Um, and so you essentially have measurements at certain points across the genome. Um, and there are very, if there's translocations or inversions, um, it's, they, don't, they won't be able to detect those either. SAGE came along in the late, late 90s, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, the, the advantages of SAGE is that you get a digital count for each transcript. You get essentially one count, uh, uh, one sequence per transcript. And that sequence um, allow allows you to map that to you map that sequence back to the genome, and from that from that uh, from that count that that are that are accumulated at that locus, you can you can ascribe that to the gene expression underlying gene expression you level. Can you explain to me what sage actually works? Sure. So the the way that sage works, you have a bunch of uh, mr you have your mRNAs. Uh, there is a ta you, there is an enzyme. They use typically NLA3, it's the four cutters used, uh, and that will, you capture these by the poly A tail, um, and so the, so, and then you get the three prime most NLA3 site, if that's the enzyme that you're using to cut. 
and then you extract 20 or so base pairs downstream of that. Um, those tags, are, you can then concatenate them together, and then you can sequence those linked tags. That, that's typically run on, on an old Sanger sequencing platform. And these counts will, these tags will then represent the three prime, three prime most tag in that, in that original mRNA population. And then you can add those up and then count them and, and get back to the, to the original gene. Now, one of the disadvantages of this approach is that you only get the three prime most sage tag, and so you won't get the expression across the whole across the whole gene. Um, so, this advan the, the advantage is you don't need to have a um, you you can do a uh, you can do novel transcript discovery. Um, uh, the disadvantages are your single tag may map to multiple locations. And alternative transcripts may share a tag, and, and if this doesn't work well, the genome is on it's a completely unknown, um, and it's relatively expensive as well, especially in capacitive chips. But as you've seen on last day, so with the with the drop in cost of, of next gen sequencing, um, it is becoming more practical to to run larger scale libraries. Now, the sort of the rough rule of thumb that's out there is that. Uh, to to uh, run a run a uh, to, if you're running a transcript sequencing experiment where you're running uh, you're just sequencing tags across your mRNA population, you need around 10 to 20 million tags to get an equivalent coverage um, of, that you would get from a ta from a equivalent dynamic range that you would expect to see uh, from uh, from a chip experiment. And so using those numbers, you can try to get a feel for the relative cost of next-gen sequencing um, in relationship to uh, using running microarrays. So there's so chips are probably going to be around uh, for, for a while, like for a while um, but the days are numbered. Some of you may have seen that um, there's an article uh, in, in Nature um, published, I forget uh, his name, postdoc uh, from George Church's lab. Um, uh, who's now at faculty uh, somewhere else? But he uh, a paper which was basically micro says, says the death of micro paper was entitled the death of micro it's a commentary piece. Um, I think they're they're going to be around for a little while longer, but they're certainly um, as we drop the cost of uh, next generation sequencing, and as features such as barcode multiplexing, which allow you to uh, multiplex in multiple samples in a single. Um, next gen run as those sort of as those techniques uh, are introduced, um, anticipate there's going to be a crossover point where it will actually be cheaper to to do a, an experiment um, using next gen sequencing. So what's the basic flow look like for an mRNA seq experiment? Well, this is where I said it's, it's, it's at this point if you've survived the math, the side the math so far, there isn't a lot more. You we just use the same methods that were talked about yesterday. Um, so. If you can align your tags to a genome, this is what you do with uh, mRNA seq experiment. So you get the tags from your transcript, um, and then you tally the tra tally the transcript counts. So you align them to the genome, um, tally the transcript counts. This this requires you to have a model of the of the genome uh, of of the of the genes. Um, but if you have an annotation for those genes, you can just simply count those up. Um, and align tags to your splice transcripts to add those all together, and, and essentially you're done. Um, so this is the, I'll go through just a few papers um, that were published um, in this space. Uh, so this was a paper published out of Sean Grimmins' lab, uh, uh, where they sequenced the use solid uh, to generate uh, 10 gigabases of data, um, and uh, they they have an approach which allowed them to map. Uh, across um, exon junctions um, using known splice events. So they took their uh, library of genes and then they created a special uh, special uh, FASTA file which include which had essentially the bridge events between the different exons. And they also generated so they generated that for the known genes and then they created all the alternative splices between those genes uh, between the exons of those genes. Um, to 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 do to allow them to do novel transcript discoveries or novel splice junction discovery as well. Uh, if a few figures from their paper, 
where you can see that there is express the expression here is localized to to for the most part to where um, there where the uh, where the exons are, uh, but there is some intronic expression as well, um, and the differences between between these two two cases here um, as well. In terms of their pipeline, this is this is the pipeline that that they developed, and it's, it's available from their website. Um, and it it's somewhat complicated, but essentially, they they sequenced originally at the time 35 mers, um, and they had a cascading flow where if it didn't match as a 35 mer, they truncated it and matched it again as a 30 mer, and then truncated it again if it didn't map and match it again as a 25 mer, um, and then they had a splice junction. Uh, uh, approach as well that I mentioned earlier, and then from this from this data they generated the bed and wiggle plots which you can import into UCSC. Um, in I'll make an AB specific comment. We also have our own pipeline as well within AB, uh, which uh, which does something something similar to this. But they're very these approaches are are, are there isn't really any magic or mystery around this. As I said, it's really just a case of aligning genes, uh, aligning tags to the genome and then counting where, uh, counting those in reference to the annotation. Uh, as you can see, just highlighting from, from the libraries here, most of the tags, about 60%, do map to known exons of the ones that do map. Um, but there's the remainder are mapping to unannotated regions. So of those unannotated genes or no, uh, un, uh, with, with, or not annotated axons, 14% um, map to known regions. They describe known regions as being a uh, region where there was some evidence of expression, such as a previous uh, EST being found there, or, or it being in another annotated uh, library, such as uh, MGC or another RefSeq set. Um, even so, there's, there's predicted regions where there's a gene prediction covering that, um, conserved regions, but there's still these, these other regions where, where we uh, where we see some expression. Uh, and then following on then from the from the ENCODE paper, which which came out in the previous year or the year before that, um, that paper showed that there was exp uh, evidence for expression really occurring across the genome. And these latest papers have. Uh, um, also um, uh, showed uh, uh, built on that and showed and, and found the same sort of uh, concepts. So another paper that uh, that used 454 um, to look at the transcriptome of ESLs, and I'll spend a couple of slides um, talking about a method that came out of Barbara Wald's lab, uh, where they used the Illumina technique to to look at liver cells. And probably the key things that they found again, they found most of the uh, they found a lot of expression occurring, uh, mostly expression occurring in terms of annotated exons. Um, I think the key points here are, if you look at the dynamic range here, 10 to the 4 to 10 to 9, that's five orders, uh, five logs, log orders. So that's um, obviously much higher than what one is seeing from microarrays. So the sensitivity of these techniques are, are a lot higher. Um, there's also, from this graph, where they're, seeing, where they're showing the saturation uh, of uh, of of uh, g of genes that are that are shown to be expressed at different expression levels. Um, so this is asking if we have for more highly expressed genes, which is shown by this this case, you don't see you don't see saturation until you get up to about 40 million tags. Uh, but if you if you're asking, well, is it just really is it expressed at all? Um, you only need around uh, 10 to 15 million tags um, before uh, even at low expression levels you're seeing most of the genes that you're going to see. So hence, the, hence my earlier um, estimate on the 10 to 20 million tags to get an equivalent expression to a microarray. Now where, where the field has gone um, into a lot more detail over the last year has been looking at um, the alternative splices. So what, where, where do, we're uh, identifying um, expression across splices uh, finding new splices. Some of the techniques uh, that uh, that are being developed now uh, are looking at uh, paired end splicing. So there's a there's a paper that came out uh, about a month ago uh, where paired end paired end uh, uh, tags uh, 
uh, were used to uh, look at into um, fusion splices um, occurring in a cancer transcriptome. Uh, and uh, there's also approaches that are that are being that are showing promise that can identify um, splices uh, using even just a single read. Um, Michael um, Stromberg and I were talking earlier. Um, Mike, when Michael Brunner gave his talk, he said there weren't really any methods that can do breakpoint resolution in in endals, which I believe is probably true today. If you were to go out and look outside um, at, uh, at at programs you can download right now, that's probably that's probably true. But in terms of certainly methods that are going to come up in the next couple of months, um, there will be methods that will allow you to to, uh, to identify breakpoint resolution of endals. Um, by using uh, by using single reads, um, and you can do the sort same. You can apply the same sort of approach to transcriptome to find fusion splices um, um, using the same same technique. So those are some of the developments in this area over over the last year. Um, now some of the issues that you have with this approach is with these appro mRNA seq approaches in general is that. Uh, as you as you may have noticed from some of these graphs, and you see this with with all the data, with both um, um, solid data and with and Illumina data and, and four by four data, um, all the data sets, that is that you get you don't get constant coverage um, over the axon, and the reasons for that there's, there's several reasons for that. Um, one is one is that they'll you will have um, different mappability across those regions of the genome. So if the of of, of the axon so, for example, uh, if you have a, a region where which is which is similar to another region in that in in a genome, then uh, your mappability will be reduced, and you may and you'll see fewer counts um, to that. The other the other reason is simply that the, the library sample preps um, and sequencing uh, methods themselves are not bias free. Um, there you know there is typically um, in any method, a, a bias, and so some sequences are going to be more prevalent than others, um, and that's just the way of the world. So the uh, the those those types of, um, of of issues lead to you seeing that the shape jaggy profile across the axon. Um, there's, you know, there's a so some of some of these map to multiplication, some of these don't map at all. Um, there's different schools of thought on how to treat multiple locations. Some people have suggested that if we map to multiple locations, you should throw it out. Others say that it's better to um, map it to a single, um, uh, map it to a single um, map, sorry, ma map each read to each of the locations to which it maps to, and then essentially divide the count by the number of, time, number of places to which it maps. Um, but there's no I've seen no uniform approach on on how to represent those types of multiple matters. Um, okay, so just and then just kind of I always like to do sort of the back of the envelope type of calculations just to think about how what we're what we actually need to do to get to certain questions. So if we're looking at exhaustive exhaustive sequencing of a transcriptome. Um, the paper by Carter et al. Uh, they estimated there's around five to 500,000 to 800,000 transcripts in a cell. Um, if we say the average size of a transcript is around 2 kb, then transcriptome in, in a single cell is around 2 gigabases, uh, which really means that the cost of, trans cost of sequencing in transcriptome is equivalent to a cost of sequencing a genome. Now, that's actually not quite true. And the reason is that in a in a because we allow because we we depend on having coverage, so we depend on having coverage to allow us to find uh, differences uh, and variations. So if they're going in a genome level, if we're looking at Michael Brudner was talking about earlier, looking at structural variants, uh, we we allow the fact that there are multiple reads crossing that structural variant to allow us to in, to find that to, to identify that variant. With, this, with, with the genome, we're really just trying to trying to construct a single consensus sequence across that genome. With a transcriptome, because you have multiple splices, that and you have multiple tennis splices, it doesn't quite work. And then the other problem you run with the transcriptome, which builds on that, is that 
different transcripts are present at different expression levels. So if a transcript is highly expressed, you're probably going to, or a gene is highly expressed, and all of its transcripts of that gene are highly expressed, you're probably going to find all the alternate splices of that gene. But if a gene is present at only low expression levels, you're not going to have enough reads covering all those breakpoints to allow you to satisfactorily recover all those alternate splices. So it's not quite true, but it, it's a kind of a, a neat rule of thumb. Um, and I'll make a, another AV specific plug, <laughs> if I may. Uh, we we uh, had a method come out earlier this year um, where we, uh, we, we actually recovered the transcriptome of a single cell. Um, and that paper is available in Nature Methods. Um, so, okay. Yes? No, I have to admit, it's been a couple of years since I read this paper, probably more than that, and so I don't don't recall. But I would imagine they did look. They looked at. They would have looked at a particular cell type. Um, so it, it is going to vary by cell type for sure. There's this, yeah. Right. Right. So, so yeah. So, so I guess I should repeat the question for the camera here. Um, the question was: certain cell types will be highly expressed in in specific um, transcript. Yes, that's very true. So, uh, we find if you sequence pancreas cells, you find huge amounts of the insulin being present, and uh, that yeah, and that swamps out all the other expression. Um, so yes, you're, you're absolutely right. If there's a, there's a gene like that, that if there's a gene like that that's turned on in a in a huge state. Now, but I actually don't know what the real answer to that question is, because what so, you know, what I throw back to you is is I don't know what's happening to all those other transcripts. Are they? Is the cell actually actively more active than other general cell types? In other words, it has way more transcripts in general and uh, and so the other cell transcripts are all present and then this one's really high or is the fact that or does that does a cell have a limited amount of mRNA production capacity in which case the fact that that one is really high means everything else is just generally low but there's not a lot more things to find I mean I, I, mean, I don't know I don't know if we know the answer to that question then the other thing that Yes. Yeah. So one of the one of the issues that, and I remember talking to uh, again blanking on black and both the name blanking on the name so, someone from uh, Max Planck. Uh, um, they were doing an experiment theoretical calculation of uh, of how many transcripts. Um, were present um, in a cell uh, in a cell using from based on the gene expression data from next gen sequencer, uh, and some of the issues that you run into is as you sequence more deeply, you you get sequencing errors, and if you have genes that are similar, a sequencing error is going to look like an expression from a closely related gene, and so he was trying they were trying to account for those types of issues. Um, so that's definitely that's definitely a problem. Yeah. Okay. So moving on. How am I doing time? Okay. Good. Um, so another class of class of uh, class of uh, experiments is looking at uh, DNA binding proteins and trying to identify where these are bound to on DNA. Um, now we could also obviously this is important from the point of view of looking at activation and repression of genes where we can identify promoters and repressors that are that are binding there and that can help us understand uh, w where things are and so we'd be interested in histone binding sites um, as and uh, and uh, also I'll talk a little bit later about methylation as well. <coughs> 
um, but you can have uh, both sites and, and seats and sites and sites and trans that can affect the expression of, of your of your protein of interest. Um, and common common sort of evolution here has been from M to chip 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 and chip seek. Um, uh, with chip seek obviously being the the mRNA uh, the next gen approach to answering this question. Uh, so the chip chromatin amino precipitation um, assay allows us to uh, uh, allows us to isolate those fragments of DNA which have a uh, protein bound to them. And the way in which is, this is done is by cross-linking so the protein is then stuck to the DNA. Um, that is, they then shared to separate out these fragments. There's an antibody of interest uh, which is targeted to find a protein that we're, we're looking at. And then we're able to enrich for that particular fragment and identify that. Now once we have these fragments, we can either sequence them, run them on a chip, uh, but what we're finding now, what of course with, with next-gen methods, the approach is to, use, to just sequence directly, and this allows us to get a much uh, better resolution on the, excuse me, <coughs> allows us to get much better resolution on the binding sites, and also look genome-wise with no prior hypothesis as to where those binding sites should be. Uh, and again, so we have the same basic <coughs> workflow where the reads are aligned to the genome and then you look for, for peaks. Um, so one of the, I think this is one of the first papers, if not the first paper that came out, um, uh, looking at uh, STAT1 binding sites. Um, they use the Illumina technology um, and they found that they were able to, in their comparisons to orthogonal methods, um, they found that they had uh, a very high sensitivity and specificity. Um, in terms of, they didn't actually have to go very deep, and this is again getting back to now with the higher throughputs. Um, you don't, you don't, you'd only need a fraction of the throughput that the uh, the uh, solid and, and aluminum technologies are currently generating in order to to actually do this type of experiment. So even with um, 24, uh, 24 million tags in total of which around 15, 12 to 15 were mapping um, uniquely, um, they actually, they got very, uh, they, they, they reached saturation uh, on, their, on their analysis. Um, and so they're able, so even with the lowest, with these, with these now low tag, low tag counts, um, you're able to, you're able to actually do these sort of experiments. So you can imagine with barcoding, you can, you can multiplex uh, 10, maybe 20 of these into a single experiment and uh, run these a lot more cheaply than you could. So these typical profiles, they look like this, where this is a stimulated one, this is the unstimulated, so it's the same region, and you can see, as one would expect, where this has been um, stimulated, there's, there's a lot more stat one binding sites that are, that are appearing. And uh, there have been other methods as well uh, that have been published in this space. This, this paper they found a 98% concordance with chip chip. Um, this is specifically showing correlations between chip seek and chip chip. And you can see these look, uh, they align very well. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting paper came out of, uh, I believe, Barbara Wolf's lab, um, showing a, a uh, Showing some of the power of these techniques, there's been um, there's been unknown what was causing uh, this gene was known to be regulated by neural D1, but but for years this has gone unknown that the it, the, the the actual binding site here uh, was not found, um, and traditional biochemistry methods and bioinformatics methods where they were looking at uh, consensus uh, binding site profiles and doing those scans had failed to find. Um, this target, they, they ran a single um, experiment, next gen experiment, and then lo and behold, they just got the answer right out. So here they were, here they were able to find, just again using this chip seek assay, um, this binding site. Uh, it just it, uh, it was it was it was a weak match to the consensus motif, which is why the original bioinformatics techniques could never found it. Um, but uh, just one run on, on an next-gen sequencer, and they got the answer. Um, 
And then just before we move on to methadone, so this, the, these methods are chip seek is fairly well established. There, in terms of looking at uh, DNA, DNA RNA binding of proteins, there's an, uh, a neat paper that came out uh, just again just a couple of months ago. Uh, the authors developed a technique that allowed them they they were bound uh, ribosomes to the RNA molecules. And they were able to then again pull out tags and identify uh, the positioning of ribosomes across uh, the mRNAs. And so they're actually able to to look to look then to determine protein translation rates and find positions where um, the ribosomes were pausing during uh, during the translation into protein. So this is this kind of neat way. I think we're going to see sort of the evolution of these sorts of techniques. Um, and there's probably new techniques that are, that are going to come out and be established uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, but these basic techniques are there and they're established. Um, and the methods uh, are, are not going to change much. Um, where I think there is, gonna, there is a still a lot of work to be done on the algorithmic side um, is in looking at methylation. Uh, so in methylation, uh, the DNA, methylated DNA with cytosines uh, are methylated. Uh, the regions uh, which are methylated are silenced, and the genes in that area are not transcribed. So, it, together with the histone modification, it's another form of of, uh, of uh, transcriptional control. And a number of techniques for, for, for doing this: you can enrich uh, high, uh, hypermethylated regions and sequence those. Uh, in terms of applying that to next-gen sequencing. Um, you can enrich those regions and then sequence those regions that are hypermethylated. Uh, another approach is to bisulfite your your bis bisulfite convert your genome. Um, that that in when you take it through that process, um, I see unmethylated C's basically get translated into thymines, um, and now this causes all sorts of problems for your sequence alignment. Unmethylated C's will get converted, but methylated C's will not. And so now your your genome is a hybrid of 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 the of the of the original where some of the some of the C's are converted into T's and others are not. So as you can imagine, uh, this causes the uh, alignment uh, to be much more difficult. Um, common techniques involve uh, looking at uh, uh, sequencing to an unmethylated genome and then sequencing to sorry sequencing to the standard genome. And then, sorry, aligning to a standard genome, and then aligning to a in silico bisulfite converted genome. That's kind of the standard, standard way to do that. But these methods are still being developed. Um, one method was one such method developed by by this group, um, where they where they use dynamic programming um, to look at to identify try and identify those regions. Um, they also use targeted sequencing. Um, to to reduce the to reduce the space, and uh, and that allows you then to have a much smaller genome, and you can do a much more exhaustive search over that reduced space. Did you? Yeah, yeah I was just going to point out one of the caveats is is when you align normally, you can really take the reverse complement of your genes and align it to the same reference. But in the bisulfite tree, the genome lock disappears, so it's no longer if you were aligning against a 3 gigabase genome, some of the gaps you're aligning against a 6 gigabase genome in order to do the same. So uh, that plays a role in the manual tool too. And it's, it's kind of interesting. In, it, you have diff so the, in, so, so this, so the 6 gigabase is if you're looking in base space, and then in color space, you actually need to do 9. So there's advantages and disadvantages of color space. The advantage in color space um, is that uh, you still have four colors that are reasonably well balanced. Uh, I don't have the stats for that here, but uh, you can imagine if you bisulfite convert your genome, if your, your C's are going to be converted to T's, you're going to end up with essentially three bases present in most of the most of the genome is not methylated, so you're going to end up with most of your C's converted to T's. But in color space, because it, it's, the colors are related to transitions, you actually don't see that much reduction in in the in in the colors. The colors, the four colors, still end up being relatively well balanced. 
The downside is that uh, when you when you uh, in, when you bisulfite convert your genome, the uh, the rule that your uh, um, that your let me get this straight. The rule that your forward and reverse strands are complementary are identical um, in color space, which is I think my, uh, which Michael or no, or one of the Michaels I think pointed out in their slides like yesterday. Um, that no longer applies, which is why you need to search against essentially nine gigabases instead of just six. Um, and uh, then another method, again, this was more exhaustive, where they where they tested reads against every possible methylation pattern and retained a new unique hit. So again, though, the basic workflow is align reads, more difficult for methylated read, uh, bisulfite converted reads, but essentially that's the same process, lining reads, counting, and, and then analyzing. So, so I mean, that's, if you can do align reads, you can basically apply any of the methods I just talked about. Um, and I'll just briefly mention, mention just metagenomics. Uh, some of the earliest papers published by, by Craig Ventron, this is probably this is one of the most well known, the one uh, where uh, sequencing of the uh, of various C samples, um, and that used Sanger sequencing. But there have been many more recent studies uh, where uh, either uh, where the te various techniques uh, for next gen sequencing have been used um, to study met meta uh, metagenomics. Um, now these are primarily used 454, but I think now people are using uh, Illumina and Solid. I'm certainly aware of Solid. Solid, people using solids, I'm so, so sure there's people using alumina as well uh, to study metagenomics uh, too. Uh, but 454 does have advantages here with a stronger or longer read length, uh, but typically these, these uh, then target the 16S, 18S ribosomal subunits and look for, ver look for variations in those units to identify species that are present. So as I mentioned earlier, so the basic process is to take your reads, you align them, um, and uh, once you have counts, you can analyze your reads using many of the existing tools and approaches. If you have counts for gene expression levels, you can plug those into GeneSpring or whatever experimental, uh, whatever research tool you've been using previously. Um, and then, uh, yeah, metagenomics has been is obviously been gaining, gaining interest in this area as well. And I think that's it. So I'll take any questions on that.